on here today um, for our Stillwater Breeding Amphibians of the Northwest talk, and I'll let her do more introduction of herself. Thanks. Hey, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Glamise. Uh, I'm a herpetologist, which basically means that I get paid to play with frogs and snakes and salamanders, which is pretty cool. Uh, I work for the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, and I'm also an adjunct instructor up at Green River Community College. Um, so yeah, I, I really like frogs, and I'm glad that you all are here and you like frogs too. So I guess we'll go ahead and get started with this, and we'll learn about how to identify some pretty common still water breeders here in Thurston County, and how you can find them and their egg masses. So first off, um, if you're kind of looking for some good guides to identify any type of frog or salamander that you find here in Washington or in the Pacific Northwest in general, um, I highly recommend both of these books. Uh, they're really great. They're super easy uh, to go through. They're not super complicated or anything, and they have a lot of really good pictures. Um, so if you're looking for anything to kind of help you nail down identification of these guys, these two books are your go-tos. So when we talk about amphibians, there are three orders of amphibians that we're usually looking at. So a neuro, which are going to be our frogs and our toads, caudata, which are our newts and our salamanders, and then gymnophonia or apoda, which are Sicilians, which we don't have in Washington. So we're just going to kind of, we're going to ignore those for now. Um, so within the anurans and the caudata groups so the frogs and the salamanders, uh, we kind of break those down into three different categories and all of that is going to be based on the reproduction of each. So we have flowing water or stream breeding species, riparian species, and then still water breeders, which the still water breeders are what we're talking about today. And still water breeders are going to be amphibians that are breeding in lakes and ponds in wetlands. So basically kind of like stagnant water type areas. So there's not a lot of flow going on there. So the first little dudes that we're gonna talk about are long-toed salamanders. These are actually our earliest breeding amphibians. So we'll actually see these guys start to emerge within the next week or two, um, especially because the weather has been so nice lately. Uh, they'll probably come out a little bit earlier. Um, but they're pretty easy to identify based on other salamanders. They have this really kind of mustardy colored mid-dorsal stripe. Um, it can be gold, yellow, or green. And it's usually not um, kind of like a solid stripe. So it kind of looks like somebody just took a mustard bottle and just squirted it on the back of these salamanders. Um, it's usually broken. It's got like drips and stuff on the side of it. And of course, based on their name, uh, the fourth hind limb toe um, is extra long. So it kind of looks like a little finger. Um, their eggs are actually pretty small. So instead of calling them egg masses, we generally call them egg packets. Um, and they generally lay their eggs in what are called ephemeral sites. So these are going to be sites um, of water that dry up pretty quickly. So they're not permanent. Um, and the reason for that is because long term salamanders actually don't do very well with ponds that have kind of big predators in them, like fish or even other amphibians. Um, so they generally like these little ponds where the water's going to dry up, they can kind of um, put their eggs in there and the eggs will develop pretty quickly and then they'll uh, come out. And typically speaking, their egg packets are going to be pretty small and they're only going to have about one to 25 little eggs within this packet. Um, a lot of times with long-toed salamander egg masses, we see single eggs. Um, but a female can lay multiple egg packets. And that's kind of an important thing to note because for some of these species that we'll talk about, uh, we can kind of do a one-to-one -one ratio of um, if we have one egg mass, we can account that for one female um, because they'll only lay one egg. But for long-toed salamanders, because females can lay multiple egg packets, uh, what it can tell us is that a long-toed salamander is there, but we don't necessarily know how many of them are there. Um, their eggs, like I said, are generally pretty small. They're really wiggly. Um, so kind of another good way to identify these guys, if you're looking in a tire rut, which seems to be a favorite spot for them to lay their eggs, um, they'll get a lot of sediment 
on top of them, right? And so it's kind of hard to tell what's an egg mass and what's a rock. And so if you take your hand or you take your foot and you put it at the edge of the water and kind of make little ripples with it, uh, you'll see that their jelly will start to kind of wiggle around. And that's how you can tell that it's an egg mass. Um, their eggs are laid in pretty cool water. So temperatures around five to six degrees Celsius. So like I said, you know, they like it pretty cold. They're our earliest breeders. So they should kind of be popping out here soon. Um, the eggs, when they first get laid, the eggs themselves are pretty distinctly bicolored. Um, so they'll be kind of brown above and white below. But as the embryos start to develop, um, that bicoloration kind of goes away. Um, another good way to tell long-toed egg masses from some other species that we'll talk about that'll look similar is they have what's called a double membrane. Um, and this will be salamander egg masses in general from frog egg masses. Um, and we've got a few pictures that'll show that a little better. Uh, so this is what I was talking about of like a single egg in a packet. Uh, so this female just went right up this branch and then just laid a bunch of these little eggs. Um, instead of just putting them all in one cohesive packet, she just decided I'm just gonna do a bunch of individual ones. If you look, really closely. Um, this picture makes it a little difficult to see, but there's a double membrane around this egg. And so you have your outer jelly here, and then within that outer jelly around the egg are two little membranes that are protecting the egg. And like I said, that's going to be a really distinguishing factor uh, that'll tell you whether or not something is a salamander versus a frog. Um, and so not many other salamanders are going to have egg packets like this, and so you can kind of narrow it down if you see a double membrane and it's a small egg packet, it's probably a long-toed salamander. Um, these are just some more pictures of their little packets, um, some of the embryos kind of developing along a little better. And then of course, once they get to a certain stage, you can see their little gills popping out um, and they start to look more like little larval salamanders. And so this picture is like a close-up inside that outer wiggly jelly um, so that you can get a good view of the double membrane around this egg. Okay, I'm gonna attempt to play a frog call and hope that you guys can hear it. Um, but these are Northern red-legged frogs. Um, these guys are pretty hardy frogs. Uh, they spend a lot of their time in the riparian areas versus in the water, so they're not super aquatic. And you're rarely gonna hear these guys call, uh, but their call's kind of cool, so let's see if this works. Okay, so I hope you guys could hear that. Um, so they've got this kind of like weird little chirpy sound. And the reason why we don't hear their calls a lot is because males will actually typically call underneath the water, um, opposed to like our tree frogs that are just yelling on the outside of the water. So that's typically why we don't hear their calls too much. Uh, they can be pretty distinguishable from other frogs that we have here um, in Western Washington because they have, as their name would suggest, uh, kind of red or pinkish wash like on their groin and leg area. Um, they also have this nice big uh, dorsal stripe that's running down their back or a dorsal ridge that's running down their back. Um, and this will be a good way to tell these guys apart from a bullfrog, um, which we will talk about later, but a lot of people kind of get those two mixed up. Um, but northern red-legged frogs will have this kind of like fold that's going all the way down from about their eye to the back part um, of their body. Uh, they're, because, they're, because they're not super aquatic, right? Uh, they don't have a lot of webbing on their feet because they spend a lot of time on land versus in the water. And their tadpoles, uh, when they hatch out of their egg masses, can actually get pretty big. Um, they can look similar to bullfrog tadpoles, um, but they don't have uh, the nice modeling that we'll kind of talk about with the bullfrogs. And uh, they have more of a mohawky looking um, kind of fin that comes up on their head. So they're kind of like, you know, punk rock frogs, I guess. Um, as far as their egg masses go, their egg masses are pretty big. Um, so you're looking at like a softball size egg mass. Um, they will typically lay them on a brace somewhere, but there's not a lot of structure to them. 
And the reason for that is because this whole egg mass is just comprised of a bunch of different little eggs put together. And so think of it kind of like a bundle of grapes. Like that's basically what a red-legged frog egg mass looks like is just a bundle of grapes. And so they'll put them on a brace and because there's not a lot of structure to them, they typically fall off the brace and they're just floating around in the pond and stuff like that. Um, they can withstand predators. So we will see um, red-legged frog egg masses in permanent ponds uh, with fish and bullfrogs and other things like that. Uh, their jelly breaks down pretty quickly uh, for the eggs, which is another reason why they fall off the brace a lot. Um, and they have like pretty decent sized egg masses. Um, so they can be just a little over like a thousand eggs within an egg mass, uh, which is pretty impressive. Um, so unlike long-toed salamanders, um, northern red-legged frogs actually do have a one-to-one -one ratio when it comes to egg masses per female. Uh, so a female red-legged frog will only lay one egg mass. Um, so we know that if we see four red-legged frog egg masses in a pond, that we at least have four females that are there, which is good. Um, they're kind of like our second amphibian to start breeding. Um, so they typically start laying their eggs in waters when they reach about six degrees Celsius. Um, so kind of mid-ish February, a little later, but again, because it's been a little warmer and we haven't had too cold of a winter yet, uh, they might kind of start breeding a little earlier. So this is just kind of like an underwater picture of these guys and they will lay their eggs like pretty far underwater sometimes. So they won't just be kind of like on the surface or anything. So they could be like pretty far down attached to, you know, a reed canary grass or a rush or something that's like completely underwater. And you can see in this picture, kind of what I was talking about, about it kind of looking like a bundle of grapes, right? Like it's a bunch of different singular eggs that are all kind of melded together. And the reason that is, is like when the female is laying her eggs, what she'll do is she'll kind of start like balling them up to wrap them around the brace. Um, and that's what creates this nice little cluster. Uh, also, because they are frogs, if you would look closely at their eggs, they would not have uh, the double membrane that's wrapped around egg itself. So they can get um, a lot of debris on them, especially when they start getting older, because again, they don't have a lot of structure. So they'll kind of start flattening out. Um, they kind of start disintegrating a little bit. And so they'll get a lot of debris and stuff on them. So they can be really, really hard to see, um, especially if you're in a wetland that has a lot of thick vegetation. Um, so when you're doing an egg mass survey, like it might not be as easy to see these guys from the bank, you would have to get kind of like in the wetland and be staring, you know, down and be like, oh, there's one. So this is just a female red-legged frog that we found. Um, when we were like taking measurements on her and stuff like that. And it's just a good video because you can kind of see the fold that's going down her back and then um, kind of like the red pinkish wash that's on her groin and her leg area. She was not too happy and we had to take a toe clip from her. So she wasn't, she wasn't thrilled about that. Okay. So the next salamanders we're gonna talk about are Northwestern salamanders. So these are, these are chunky boys. Like they're pretty thick salamanders and in general, their egg masses are actually really easy to identify. So they make uh, pretty good egg masses for kids to see and stuff like that um, because you really can't mistake them for anything else. Um, so these salamanders are really large. They're completely brown. Um, a lot of people want to get these salamanders up with Pacific giant salamanders that we have here. Um, Pacific giants are stream breeders, uh, so they're not going to be around wetlands or ponds or anything. And Pacific giants generally have nice modeling on them, whereas these Northwestern salamanders are just completely brown. Um, they have these nice parotid glands on their head, um, which kind of emit a toxin when they get uh, really irritated. And so they'll go into this defensive posture stance and the kind of milky secretion that you see coming from this one's uh, tail uh, is just its toxin and it makes it unpalatable. Um, it's not dangerous to people, though it could make you very sick. Um, so just like, just don't eat, just don't eat salamanders. Um, 
Mark, my big, big boss, uh, often says that adults are rarely seen. I have found many adult Northwestern salamanders, especially if you go out to McLean. Um, Long-toed salamanders, on the other hand, uh, are a little, I think, more uh, cryptic than these guys. They do tolerate uh, permanent water really well, and they can live alongside fish and bullfrogs and a lot of other predators. Um, and a lot of that has to do with their toxins. Um, because they're not very palatable, uh, they're able to kind of withstand um, a lot of bigger predators like that. Um, like I said, they're also pretty easily distinguishable because they're thick, like three C thick. Like these costal grooves are very obvious on Northwestern salamanders. Um, so they're pretty, they're pretty chunky salamanders, which makes them pretty easy to identify compared to the other guys we'll talk about. Um, their egg masses are pretty like super, super firm. So they're also kind of uh, grapefruit sized and they will be attached to a brace. And they're generally attached to a pretty strong brace because they're heavy egg masses. So they have a lot of really good structure to them. So if you were to pick up one of these egg masses from the water, it wouldn't just fall through your fingers like a red-legged frog's would. Like the structure is there and it actually takes quite uh, a bit of time, like seven to 10 months for the egg like mass jelly in general to even break down off these guys. And so, You'll often kind of find remnant egg masses of these in ponds, even after the salamanders have emerged from them. Um, they typically start breeding when the waters are about five to six degrees Celsius. So around the time that red-legged frogs will start coming to ponds, uh, we generally kind of see these two breeding together. Um, they, their egg masses, unlike red-legged frogs, are pretty smooth. So instead of being a bunch of individual eggs that are all kind of clustered together like grapes, uh, Northwestern salamander egg masses kind of look like a brain. So there's this big, thick, smooth jelly that's over top of the eggs. And you can see kind of like a little bit of the ridges where like each individual egg is, but it's more cohesively formed together. So it kind of looks more like a brain than it does a cluster of grapes. Um, also, because these are salamanders, if you would look closely inside of an egg mass, uh, you would be able to see that double membrane um, around the egg. Um, like I said, these guys are really obvious to see. Uh, they're smooth, they're big. When they're first laid, they're like this super bright white color. Like they've got this weird white iridescence to them. Um, and so especially if you're in a pond that's like relatively clear, um, you can actually see their egg masses uh, pretty well. Um, a really good place to go for that too is if you ever go out to the Nisqually Wildlife Refuge, when the Northwestern start laying their eggs, you can walk on the boardwalk and you can see these eggs from a distance, really like standing out and shining like in the wetlands that they have out there. Um, they have a really interesting um, symbiotic relationship with algae. And so they're bright, bright white when they're first laid. And then as they kind of start developing, um, this algae starts developing within the egg capsules themselves. Um, and the algae will take in all the kind of like nitrogenous waste that the uh, embryos are giving off. And in exchange for that, it releases oxygen. And so it's this really cool kind of symbiotic relationship between um, the Northwestern salamander eggs and uh, the algae. We do kind of see this sometimes in the red-legged frogs, uh, but not as often as we do uh, the Northwestern salamanders. Um, a, a kind of like the red-legged frogs though too, Northwestern salamanders do have a one-to-one -one ratio of egg mass per female. So if we find again like three Northwestern egg masses in a pond, we know that there are three female Northwesterns uh, somewhere. Uh, Northwestern salamanders uh, in their adult form are usually terrestrial, but they can be what's called neotenic, which is where they retain larval characteristics of having gills, um, and kind of staying in the water as opposed to metamorphing out and being on land, um, which is something I guess I didn't mention at the beginning of this. Um, kind of a note when we talked about the three different groupings uh, that we put them in based on reproduction, the stillwater breeders are always gonna have an aquatic larval stage. And so adults will go to a pond, they'll lay their eggs, 
The eggs uh, will then hatch out into some type of larval form. So for salamanders and newts, you get kind of like little larval salamanders with these gills on the side of their neck. And then for the frogs and toads, you get tadpoles. And so they stay in that phase for a little bit and then metamorph out into you know, their terrestrial phase. Um, so Northwesterns are kind of interesting because they don't always have to metamorph out into that terrestrial phase. They can actually stay in their aquatic phase, but just get bigger. So this is just showing more of this symbiotic relationship. Um, and the algae will actually stay in the egg capsules even after uh, the salamanders hatch out of them. So this is a good example. Uh, so that's a little Northwestern in the middle there eating a worm. And you can see how sturdy this egg mass is. So if you pick up one of these egg masses, like I said, um, which try not to do that obviously because you don't want to disturb the egg mass and stuff. Um, but if you would pick up one of these egg masses, you could see that you could actually hold it in your hand. It is a very solid egg mass. Um, so this is a way, uh, or this is just a picture to differentiate the red-legged frog from Western. Um, so you can see the red-legged frog egg mass is a little more spread out, right? Because it doesn't have a lot of structure. Um, it looks more like a bunch of little grapes versus this Northwestern egg mass is pretty solid, looks kind of more smoothed over, more like a brain. Um, and it's keeping its shape because there's a lot of like structural integrity to it. Um, and again, if you would look closely at both of these, you would notice that the Northwestern has this double membrane around it and the red legged frog does not. All right, we'll talk briefly about organ spotted frogs. Um, they are a federally listed species. We do a lot of surveys uh, with them, including pit tagging and setting up arrays to kind of monitor uh, like where they're going and uh, how they're breeding. Um, but they are an endangered species. They are federally listed. If you think that you have organ spotted frogs uh, somewhere on your property, please contact us and let us know. Um, I will play the call for these guys, but it's kind of, it's a little difficult to, to hear, but it kind of sounds like somebody knocking on wood. So a lot of times when we're out doing organ spotted frog surveys, uh, there's always the game of whether or not it is a woodpecker or if it's an organ spotted frog uh, calling. So organ spotted frogs are gonna be pretty distinguishable from red-legged frogs. Um, their egg masses will be a little difficult, but we'll get into that to distinguish from red-leggeds. Um, but for organ spotted frogs, uh, they are, like a strictly aquatic species of frog. So they're never really out on land. They spend all of their time in the water. Um, and typically what they do is they find these kind of ponds that have a deep section that'll stay permanent most of the year. And then that floods out during the breeding season into these really, really shallow areas. Um, so they will not lay their eggs in deeper parts of the water like red-legged frogs will. Uh, they lay their eggs in I mean, it could be millimeters of water. Like it's very, very shallow water. Um, because they are highly aquatic, their eyes actually sit on top of their head and are rotated at a 45 degree angle. And the reason for that is so that they can kind of sit underwater with their little eyes popped up uh, above the water, kind of like a stereotypical frog style um, because they are ambush predators. So it's a good way for them to catch food, but also it's a really good way for them to watch for predators. Um, because they are highly aquatic, they have a lot of webbing on their feet, especially their back feet. And so that's another way that you can tell them apart from red-legged frogs. Um, they do have little spots kind of on their back and they're kind of this like raggedy looking spot. Um, some of them do have kind of um, a colorful wash underneath of them um, or on top of them, um, but not all of them have that. Um, and especially if it's like colder outside, you won't see it as predominantly. Um, but we typically find them in prairie habitat, which is a big reason why they are listed because we don't have a lot of prairie habitat left. Um, and that's very sad. Um, 
But another thing that makes them pretty distinguishable from red-legged frogs is organ spotted frogs are communal breeders. Um, so basically when you find one organ spotted frog egg mass, uh, you typically find many more kind of gathered around it. And so um, they'll kind of go into these really shallow areas um, and lay all of their eggs. And sometimes like a female will lay an egg mass right on top of another female's egg mass. Um, they again have the one-to-one -one ratio. So we know for every one egg mass that we find, we at least have one female. Um, these egg mass surveys that we do are extremely important because we are trying to monitor populations. Um, but yeah, other than the communal breeding and where exactly you would find the eggs, organ spotted frog eggs are gonna look very, very, very similar to red-legged frog egg masses. So they're kind of the individual eggs that look like a bundle of grapes that are kind of sitting together. Uh, these guys will typically breed around the time that red-legged frogs will. Um, maybe a little later. Uh, they really like that shallow area because the water gets a lot warmer um, and it gets a lot more sun exposure, right? Um, but the problem with that is when we have frost moments, the top part of the eggs will often get kind of like frostbitten a little bit and some of them can make it out, but some of them don't because of that, so. So this is just another example of the communal breeding. So you can see there are a bunch of eggs here and they are all in very, very shallow water. Um, so unless another female has laid an egg mass on top of uh, another female's egg mass, typically like the tops of the egg masses will be sitting um, out of the water or exposed. All right, Pacific tree frogs. Um, so these are our most common frogs here in Washington. I'm sure everybody has seen these. Um, and they are also our loudest frogs uh, for being our smallest ones. Uh, so I'll play this and I'm sure most of you guys have heard this call before. So really typical frog sound. And when there are a bunch of them uh, at night, they can be pretty, uh, pretty deafening. They come in a multitude of colors, uh, which makes them pretty cool. But uh, this kind of little eye stripe right here um, is a good way to distinguish them as well as their little round toe pads. Um, so for some reason, you're not sure if the frog that you're looking at is a tree frog, look for the little kind of like mask on the face, but also look at their little toes. Uh, so tree frogs have the round toe pads, which helps them climb up things. Um, and it's a good way to distinguish them um, from other frogs here in Washington. It's also a good way to distinguish tree frogs in general, anywhere you are uh, from any other frogs. Um, these frogs can actually change their color. Um, they can't do it immediately like chameleons do, but over a little period of time, they can actually change their color based on environmental factors. Uh, but that eye mask will always stay the same. Uh, they're pretty small in size. Uh, they are one of our smallest frogs here. Uh, like I said, they have a lot of different color morphs and their eggs are also in tiny little egg packets. Um, so these are going to be really confusing um, if you see a tree frog egg mass and a long toed egg mass next to each other. Um, they typically like ephemeral ponds as well. So they typically like ponds that dry up, but we have found them in permanent ponds before. They don't do very well in permanent ponds because they're like small little snacks. And so they get eaten up by other amphibians and fish. Um, their egg packets typically have more eggs within them than long-toed salamanders would. So I mentioned that long-toed salamanders will lay a single egg in a packet sometimes. Tree frogs will never do that. Um, tree frogs typically have 25 or more eggs in a packet. Um, and they're not super distinctly bicolored uh, when they're first laid like the long-toed salamanders are. And if you ever see a tadpole and you're not sure if it's a tree frog or not, if you would look down at the tadpole, their eyes are situated on the side of their head. So it kind of breaks out the silhouette a little bit. Um, if for some reason you're ever looking at a tadpole and decide that you want to try to identify what it is. Um, so this is just an example of what the packet looks like. Um, so, I mean, they're semi-bicolored, but not as like starkly distinct as the long-tailed salamanders are. 
Um, like the long toes, that outer jelly is like really wiggly. It's kind of snotty, um, but they're not gonna have this double membrane inside of it um, like the long toed salamanders would. And their eggs in general in these packets are a lot smaller um, than long toed salamanders are. Um, but again, that can kind of be hard to see if you don't have both of them beside each other, right? Um, so typically if you're looking at a little egg packet that has a lot of eggs in it, it's most likely gonna be a tree frog. And so this is a good example of the difference between the long toed and the uh, tree frog egg masses. So with the long toed, you can see that, you know, there's this distinct black on top. And if you would turn it over, there would be a distinct cream color and like a nice, like clean line. It has the double membrane and they're pretty large compared to these dudes. So there's a lot more eggs in the tree frog egg packet. It's a little less distinctly bicolored and the eggs themselves are a lot smaller. So I know that like, you guys can't talk right now. So we'll, I guess, uh, semi do this quiz. So these are two different frogs. Um, this one is a tree frog and this one is a red-legged frog. Um, they are the same size because this is just a juvenile red-legged frog. And so if you would ever come across this and you would be like, oh, like, I'm not sure if these are the same frog or not. You'll notice that they both kind of have that eye stripe, but the tree frog's eye stripe is a lot more distinct. The red-legged frog has that nice uh, fold that I was talking about, that nice ridge that's going down the back. And then of course, if you would look at their toe pads, the tree frogs got these nice circular toe pads, whereas the red-legged frogs toe pads are a little more pointy. Okay, Western toads. So toads are super cute. If you leave today learning anything, just learn that you love toads. Um, we don't really have uh, toads uh, breeding in Thurston County, though we did have one report that we're looking into uh, where one of our biologists at Fish and Wildlife thought that she might have found a western toad egg mass last year. So we'll be looking into that this year. Um, I'll play the sound for western toads, but we rarely hear them calling. <laughs> so um, Okay, so toads. Everybody always asks the question, what's the difference between a toad and a frog, right? So the biggest distinguishing factor that'll help you identify a toad if you ever find one are those huge parotid glands behind their eyes, um, and that's where they emit uh, their toxins. Um, and they're also really warty, right? So a lot of our other frog species are pretty smooth skinned, um, whereas toads are super bumpy, they're super warty. Um, they're also pretty like riparian heavy species. So toads really only come down to the water to breed and then the rest of the time they're spending up in the riparian area, under logs, climbing things horribly. Um, toads are also notoriously clumsy. Uh, they cannot jump very well. So when they try to run away from you, they're knocking into rocks, they're tumbling over things. Um, it's sad, but it's also really adorable. Um, which is why people love toads. And for the Western toad, a good distinguishing factor is this nice bright stripe that's going down their back. Um, even when they're small and they're dark, you will still see this. Uh, Western toads kind of have a variety of colors, uh, but that dorsal stripe will be present in all of those colors. And toads can get pretty big. Um, if you've ever seen when they first emerge uh, out of their ponds or out of their wetlands, there are these teeny tiny guys and there's just thousands of them everywhere. And it kind of looks like the ground is like moving stuff because there's so many toads, a plague of toads. Um, but then when they get older, we have found females that are real chunky, real huge. Um, and females are larger than males. Um, and so when we kind of do our toad surveys and stuff, females are pretty easy to identify. Um, they don't have a lot of predators because they are uh, pretty toxic. Um, garter snakes can eat them and there have been reports of ravens, raccoons, and coyotes being able to figure out ways to eat them without being, um, without ingesting their toxins. I mean, they're just, they're, they're just, they're adorable. They're adorable. 
Um, so their egg masses are super, super distinct. You are not going to mix them up with anything else. Uh, they basically look like spaghetti noodles. Um, they're these long, narrow strings. Uh, they've got this really soft jelly. It typically starts getting sediment on it pretty quickly. Um, and it'll break down pretty quickly as well. They're not attached to anything, so they don't put them on a brace or anything like that. Uh, female toads just lay their eggs and hope for the best. These guys will not start breeding until kind of late spring, early summer. Um, and their egg masses can have a few thousand to over 20,000 eggs in them. So it's pretty amazing when you see uh, these huge strings of egg masses. And then after a while, thousands and thousands of tadpoles have popped out of them. And then you get thousands of little metamorph toadlets that come out of the ponds. Um, their toad or their tadpoles are completely black. So they have no modeling on them whatsoever. So they're pretty distinguishable uh, from the other tadpoles. Um, and the interesting thing about Western toads is they are classified as still water breeders. So we typically see them in lakes and ponds and wetlands, but it's really fascinating because in the Chehalis River Basin, uh, which is where I do most of my amphibian work, and then in a few other river systems, the toads actually breed in stream. So they find these little kind of slow moving areas of the river and they'll just lay their egg masses in that. And it's really bizarre and it's really kind of amazing. Um, but yeah, they're, they're just like the extreme toads versus, you know, kind of like the laid back, I'm gonna lay my eggs in a wetland or a lake toad. Um, and a fun fact too, is that Western toads diets uh, consist about 70% of ants. And so when we start seeing like a decrease in like good riparian area, we start seeing a decrease in a lot of different ant species. And because of that, we don't often see toads in those areas um, where we would kind of expect to see them before. So this is just a picture of kind of what their egg masses look like. Like I said, they're just strings of eggs. There are very rare occasions where sometimes a female red-legged frog won't bundle up her eggs. And so a red-legged frog egg mass can kind of look stringy, but it's not gonna be nice and smooth uh, like toad egg masses are. It'll still be kind of like a little string of grapes instead of just a smooth noodle. Uh, so this is just an example of how many tadpoles can come out of one egg mass and tadpoles will often stay in their cohort. Um, so you can have two co cohorts of tadpoles kind of cross paths and they will just go right back uh, to like their family unit or their family cohort, which is really neat. Um, but yeah, there's like thousands of them and it's pretty amazing. Uh, so this is just a, a video of the crazy chaos that is toad tadpoles in a tiny pool. So as you can see, there are a lot of them. All right, rough skin newts. These are a pretty common uh, amphibian that you will see in the Pacific Northwest, especially if you have ever been out to the McLean Creek Nature Trail, that is just their home to be basically. Um, they're pretty hardy, um, you know, uh, newts. Uh, we have found newts in biodiesel runoff ponds. Um, they're kind of pretty, they're pretty hardy amphibians. Um, so they can kind of be distinguished from other uh, salamanders and stuff that we have because they have this really bright orange belly. Um, and the top of their skin generally when they're on land is pretty bumpy, um, but the males will often kind of smooth out a little more, especially uh, if they're in water or they're a little more aquatic. Um, so the thing to really look for is kind of like the brown top with that bright orange belly. Um, and the reason they have that bright orange belly is because they emit tetrodotoxin. So tetrodotoxin is the same poison that is found in pufferfish. Um, it's extremely uh, deadly and there are some populations of rough skin newts that can actually kill humans. Um, so it is, it is really best to leave these guys alone uh, when you see them or if you do happen to handle um, a rough skin newt for whatever reason, make sure that you wash your hands uh, really well before sticking food in your mouth or anything. Um, they live in a pretty diverse 
uh, amount of habitat. So we have found them at high elevation. We have found them in low elevation. We have found them close to salt water, um, but they generally like permanent ponds. Um, and the reason for that is because it takes them a while to kind of develop into their adult form. Um, so uh, they typically like um, more permanent uh, areas and they're toxic at all of their life stages. So from their eggs to their larva to their adults, they're extremely toxic, which is why they can kind of live alongside fish and stuff. Um, they're kind of, they're a little, they're a little extreme and like they know they're extreme. Um, if you've ever seen a newt cross like a trail or anything, um, they're just kind of like, they have no care in the world and they kind of wish that an animal would try to eat them because the animal's not gonna make it. Um, they're also pretty uh, intense egg eaters. Uh, so not only will they eat their own eggs, uh, but they will actually eat uh, the eggs of a lot of other salamanders or uh, frogs. Um, the Northwestern salamander egg mass, you know, that whole thick outer egg mass for Northwesterns is designed too so that predators can excavate into it. Um, but there have been plenty of times where we have seen newts just face deep into these Northwestern egg masses because they are just determined to get those eggs. Um, because rough skin newts are so toxic, uh, there's actually only one animal in the entire world that can eat them, and that is the common garter snake. Um, and so rough skin newts and common garter snakes have co-evolved into kind of like this evolutionary arms race with one another. So as newts become more toxic, uh, garter snakes build up a better immunity, and then the newts become more toxic and the garter snakes build up a better immunity. And so it just kind of goes like back and forth and back and forth, which is why we have populations of rough skin newts that are so extremely toxic. Um, the newts egg masses, oops, uh, the newt egg masses um, are pretty distinguishable. Uh, so females will only lay a single egg, but they will lay multiple single eggs around a pond. And what a female will do is she will lay the egg usually in a grass leaf or under moss or under some type of vegetation. And then she will take her feet and wrap the vegetation around her egg like a little present basically. Um, and their eggs are very tight. So unlike a long-toed salamander egg mass that might just have one egg in it, um, the newt's single egg, that outer wiggly jelly is really compacted in. And so if you look at this picture um, of this little egg mass, you can see that double membrane right there around the actual egg, right? But notice that like that outer jelly is super, super compact. So it's not gonna be super wiggly. These guys are incredibly hard to find. Um, and like I said, because a lot of times too, the female will kind of wrap vegetation around her egg. Um, this is just a video of, uh, we had at least 10,000 newts in this pond and uh, it was just a high alpine pond and there was nothing else living in this pond because the newts had basically eaten everything. <laughs> But you could see uh, on a lot of those that bright kind of orange belly and stuff like that. Like I said, we we had gone up to these lakes uh, looking for a different species and this lake had what we estimated to be at least 10,000 newts in it and no other animals living in this pond. So um, like I said about their eggs, their eggs are really tight. Uh, they're typically brown above and the stomach, or as like the embryo starts to develop, um, you'll kind of see that yellow color, orange coloration that you see in adults, like in the embryo itself. Um, and the eggs are laid singly, they're not close together and typically the female will lay them around the pond. So she's not gonna lay them all in one area. She'll lay one, then maybe go across the pond and lay another one. Um, and they typically like relatively warm water. So 
kind of like the toads, these guys aren't gonna start breeding until kind of later spring, early summer. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, they also have a really interesting symbiotic relationship with algae, but instead of it being inside the egg, it's actually inside the gut of uh, the larval uh, newt. So you can kind of see this kind of green tinge on this larva. All right. The last guy that we're going to talk about is not a native species here to Washington. It is highly invasive and we've actually got a pretty big problem with it. And that is the American bullfrog. I'm sure some of you guys have probably seen these frogs. They're pretty iconic. Um, coming from Kentucky, bullfrogs are native, but they are still a big issue. Um, <clears throat> yeah, people catch them and eat frog legs, but they don't really do that here. Um, so this is their call. So I don't know how many of you all remember like the old 90s Budweiser commercials, but they used bullfrog uh, for those. So bullfrogs are pretty easily identifiable. They've got that classic kind of green coloration. Sometimes they can have a little bit of spotting on their back, um, but the way that you're gonna identify these dudes from maybe like a red-legged frog or a organ spotted frog is they don't have that line going down their back. There's not a fold or anything that's going down that back. So their dorsal fold just wraps around their tympanum, uh, what is also their eardrum. Um, and so that's how you can kind of tell these guys from uh, like red-legged frogs or maybe a small tree frog, if it's a juvenile bullfrog or an organ spotted frog. Um, these guys are also very highly aquatic. So like organ spotted frogs, their eyes are gonna be setting um, on top of their heads and their feet are gonna be pretty heavily webbed. Um, they can get extremely big um, and they will eat anything that can fit in their mouth. Uh, there's been records of them eating birds, eating small mammals, along with obviously like fish and salamanders and other aquatics. Um, we actually do have a problem with uh, bullfrogs eating small Western pond turtles, which are also a state listed species. Um, so we do a lot of bullfrog work to try to get that population under control uh, so that we can help out uh, our native species. Tadpoles, uh, bullfrogs can also grow very large and it can usually take about two to four years uh, for them to actually like metamorph out into adult form. Um, and so if they've kind of got like a nice area, a nice pond that's got a lot of food, um, it's pretty like nutrient rich and stuff like that, they'll just kind of hang out there for however long until they decide that they wanna pop out and be adults. Their egg masses, however, are kind of interesting. Um, <clears throat> so bullfrogs lay a sheet, basically, of eggs. And it's just this floating sheet. So it's not kind of coerced into a ball or anything. It's just like somebody just splattered a bunch of eggs everywhere. And the eggs themselves within the egg mass are super, super tiny. Like for a frog that gets so big, their eggs themselves like really small. Um, they'll usually kind of drape it over vegetation um, and they can be incredibly hard to see. They typically lay their eggs in the summer. Um, so we won't see them during like the winter or anything like that. And so when we go out and do uh, bullfrog surveys and like bullfrog egg mass surveys, it's generally in the summer. Um, the reason why bullfrogs are such an issue, their egg masses, a single egg mass can have anywhere from 8,000 eggs to over 120,000 eggs in them. And females can lay a second egg mass later in the season um, if she feels like it's necessary. That egg mass won't necessarily have as many eggs as her first one did, but you can imagine if she laid an egg mass that had 120,000 eggs in it and then still decides to lay an egg mass that has 10,000 eggs in it later in the season, that's a lot of bullfrogs and it's a big issue. Um, their egg mass jelly tends to break down pretty rapidly. Um, and yeah, they typically kind of lay when the waters are about 68 degrees. So we kind of start doing those like midsummer. And so this is just so you can kind of see how small the actual eggs are. It's really kind of difficult to get a picture of their egg masses because 
like I said, where it's just a sheet, it gets entangled in vegetation a lot um, and it becomes incredibly difficult to see them. And so this is just kind of like an up close picture of the egg mass so you can see how small and how many there are uh, in the single egg mass. A lot of times too, they'll get vegetation on top of it. So we'll get duckweed or wolfia that kind of forms on top of the egg mass, which then also makes it extremely difficult uh, to see where the eggs are. Um, so yeah, bullfrogs are kind of like a really big issue because not only are they highly adaptable, uh, so we find them in a lot of different systems if they get into them, um, they eat everything, but they are also a carrier for rana and chytrid, which is a really big issue uh, for a lot of our native amphibians. Okay, it's a little harder to do this quiz because I can't see you all or see what your answers are. So we'll kind of go through this and um, I'll give you some hints and then you can think in your head of what you think it is and then I'll just tell you what it is. <laughs> all right, so super firm egg mass. It's on a pretty good brace. You can hold it in your hand. Uh, it's smooth on the outside. And if you would look pretty close into it, you would see that there is a double membrane. So this is a Northwestern salamander egg mass. Uh, so this egg mass is going to be a sheet. So it's not kind of balled up into an egg mass form. There are tons of eggs in this, and they are very tiny. Um, so this is going to be a bullfrog egg mass. The little noodle, the strings of eggs, uh, all small, but uh, plenty of them and no kind of cohesive structure besides being in a noodle. So this is going to be a Western toad egg mass. This is a little tricky. Um, so if you were to look at this egg mass, you would notice one, there are a lot of eggs in this little packet. Um, the eggs are very small and there's not a double membrane around them and they're not distinctly bicolored. So this is a tree frog egg mass. This one is also in a small packet. There are many things in it. Uh, so many little eggs, many little larvae in it not distinctly bicolored, no double membrane. This is gonna be a tree frog again. Uh, we have singly laid eggs here. Uh, if you would look close, you would notice that there's a double membrane. However, notice that the jelly around it is not super compact, uh, so it's still wiggly. Um, so this would be, and if you looked at it, it would be distinctly bicolored. Um, so this guy is gonna be a long-toed uh, egg mass. This one, you've got a really tight jelly around it, a double membrane, and this picture doesn't show it very well, but if you were to look at this belly, it would be kind of like a creamy orange yellow color. Um, and notice that it's on kind of like the inner part of a piece of vegetation that has been wrapped around it. So this is a rough skin newt. Uh, this one is a bunch of individual ones, kind of looks like a cluster of grapes, right? Uh, this is not in a shallow part, so this is in a pretty deep part of the pond. Uh, so this is going to be a red-legged frog egg mass. Uh, the noodles again, so this is a toad. This is in deep water, so even though there are a lot of them here, this is deeper water. Um, a bunch of different clusters of them. So this is actually gonna be a red-legged frog one. This one was like a little tricky. <laughs> uh, shallow parts of the wetland, communal breeding that we can see going on. Uh, egg masses look like a cluster of grapes. So this is gonna be our Oregon spotted frogs. Uh, this one is gonna be an egg mass that no longer has anything in it, but it is super firm. You could hold it if you wanted to, and there is a symbiotic relationship happening within the egg mass with algae. So, rather good frogs, or not? Right. Oh my God, northwestern salamanders. Um, so the reason why, like, all of this is important, like, you know, why should you go out and like look for egg masses and like, you know, do reporting and kind of like community science type stuff, 
is because we know that there are about 7,000 known species of amphibians worldwide. But of those 7,000 species, we know that a third of those are threatened. And we know that in the last two decades, nearly 168 species have, believe, have gone extinct and at least 2,500 species have populations that are rapidly declining. And that includes native species that we have here. Uh, we know that Western toad populations, even though they lay massive amounts of egg masses, we know that their populations are declining. And we know that organ spotted frog obviously are declining because they are federally listed. And a lot of that has to do with a lot of different factors, including habitat destruction and climate change and introduced species and new diseases. But that's where people like you can come in handy. So kind of allowing us to gather this essential data um, helps us kind of monitor populations of all of these guys because we can't get into all of the wetlands. We can't get into all of the backyards and find all of these frogs and all of these salamanders. And so relying on the public to also be like, hey, I found this egg mass in my backyard pond, or I found this egg mass uh, on my walk, or I saw this salamander, kind of helps us keep an estimate of the population of these guys so we can figure out if their populations are declining and what we can do if they are. So amphibians are really good environmental indicator species, right? If we start losing our amphibians, then we know that something is wrong with the environment. They are incredibly sensitive to change in pollutants. Um, so we kind of consider them like the canary in the coal mine. You know, everybody pays attention to these big megafauna species like tigers and pandas, and it's super important, but these little guys are kind of our indicator species before we get to the point of losing, you know, these big kind of charismatic megafauna. And I mean, who doesn't like frogs? Like frogs and salamanders are just great. And, you know, we want to keep them around and we want to make sure that everybody gets a chance to see them and enjoy them and like hear them, you know. So quote that I always use for my students and for anybody I talk to is from Dr. Jane Goodall that says, what you do makes a difference and you just have to decide what kind of difference you want to make. So with that, that's all I've got. So questions, comments, concerns, facts about frogs, anything, I'm open to it. Okay, so I have a question that says, are the Pacific tree frog egg packets covered with sediment like the long-toed salamander? So yes. Uh, often, I mean, it's just really dependent on the wetland or the tire rut or whatever they're laying their eggs in. But typically, if there's a lot of sedimentation on it, all egg masses will get covered with sedimentation, um, which can make it a little more difficult to kind of determine what they are. Uh, when we go out and do egg mass surveys, sometimes what we'll do is stick kind of like a white container or something underneath the egg mass. And if you kind of wiggle it around just a little bit, sometimes you can get the sediment to come off of it, or you can at least uh, get a clear view of the little egg itself underneath the sediment. How about cascade frogs, not in Thurston? No, so cascade frogs are gonna be kind of higher elevation frogs. Um, so, if you were in a high elevation area, uh, you'll kind of get like a, there's like a midpoint between an overlap between red-legged frogs and cascade frogs, but we typically only see cascade frogs in really high elevation areas, which we don't like typically have in Thurston County. I don't think we've found any in Capitol Forest, so. Michelle, it looks like there's a question for you. <laughs> and I think you're muted. <laughs> Thanks. I'm always looking for new sites. Uh, the Kaiser Woods, no, I have not actually checked that one out. I know that there's been concerns in that area about, um, about the amphibians. Uh, it's it's actually difficult to find new sites as a lot, even though they may be there, it's um, a lot of the ponds that are in the urban area don't have a lot of vegetation around them. So when we go out to actually do our surveys, we're not actually finding them, although they are in, in, the, in the larger areas. Um, so they're a little bit more dispersed. 
I have surveys set up. Those are right now, they're actually closed because they, we're only allowing four people because of the COVID um, restrictions. Um, and doing it at a with the um, family members signing up together. Um, but hopefully next year we'll be able to get out and do more surveys than not. Um, those surveys are gonna start in February. We often <laughs> pair this talk with a survey of Hanson Stormwater Pond. And um, towards the end of the month, I do have a survey for Hanson. So we do start seeing the long-toed salamanders in January. And if it's really warm, we have seen tree frogs at the same time, their egg packets at the same time, but primarily it's the, the long-toed first, then the Northwest salamanders and the red-leggeds. Mm -hmm. All right, so when is the best time to start and stop checking regularly for egg masses? So typically when we do egg mass surveys, um, we will start mid-January because like Michelle said, sometimes the long-toed salamanders can kind of start going earlier depending on the weather. Uh, so we typically start mid-January. Uh, we pick up pretty heavily in February and March for long toads, tree frogs, uh, Northwesterns, and uh, red leg frogs. Um, typically around April, we stop seeing them. Tree frogs will kind of sporadically come and go. Um, and then we get into our toad surveys uh, May through June. Uh, but again, there's not typically, we there's only one weird suspicious egg mass that might have been found for Western Toads in Thurston County. Uh, so if you think that you find Western Toads in Thurston County, you can contact us and let us know that. But uh, typically those surveys are uh, more deep in the Chehalis Basin. And we can put Lamise's um, email in the chat line. That may help if you want to contact her. Um, I had a question about what's being done about control of bullfrog populations. Um, it's really difficult to control bullfrog populations. Um, they're ambiguous all over. We have, they live in storm ponds. Um, they travel and migrate to other ponds. They infiltrate just about every single um, uh, permanent water source that we have. Uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife right now is trying to get a handle on how many bullfrogs there are and on which ponds. This summer, we're hoping to participate with them in doing a survey, which is a bullfrog calling survey. So um, kind of stay tuned for that because that'll be this summer or late, late spring. Um, and I'll have more information. I haven't been able to get a hold of them um, because nobody's working in their office right now. So um, I know that I know that we have had bullfrog control and euthanization, um, either through chemical euthanization of the entire ponds using something like rope known, because the larvae will actually in this in this climate right now, before climate change takes further a hold we're seeing that the larvae take about two seasons to develop, but with the increase in our temperatures, they're actually predicting that it'll be only one season. So we'll actually have more bullfrogs than we have had in the past. So you can also, um, if you do come across them and you've collected, if you know what you're doing and can actually identify the larva, um, a, a uh, acceptable euthanization is actually freezing. All right. Uh, so somebody asked, how fast can Pacific tree frogs change colors? Is it minutes, hours, days, or weeks? Uh, we've had it in minutes before, like not like three minutes, but in about 30 minutes. Uh, we had a green uh, Pacific tree frog in a bucket and turned around and all of a sudden there was a brown tree frog in the bucket and there was a lot of confusion <laughs> uh, until we figured out, until Mark, our boss was just like, oh yes, they can change colors. And we're like, oh. Um, it's, it's pretty dependent on several kind of like environmental factors like temperature and certain things in the water and the environment that'll cause them to kind of change colors like that. 
couple of questions about um, field guides for egg masses. I'm actually not familiar with any field guides that are specific for egg masses. Are you, Elise? Yeah. No, those, those two field guides that we mentioned earlier, some of them have some pictures of egg masses in them, but. And the Leonard one has no egg masses in it. Um, mm. I have put together um, kind of a cheat sheet for folks when they're out in the field. I can, I'll make myself a note and post that on the stream team website because that would be helpful. Um, what else do we have here? <laughs> Um, no, um, th the question about citizens supposed to kill uh, bullfrogs and their eggs. Um, that's kind of a hot topic that brings up a lot of politics and um, issues with um, folks being able to identify. So it's actually not recommended. You can contact US Fish and Wildlife Service uh, Teal Waterstrat is head of one of those sections for amphibians, and you can contact them and get it on their list. But I wouldn't, um, I guess I wouldn't promote going out and destroying bullfrogs just because a lot of people can't identify them correctly. And yeah, there's just a lot more to it than just that. So mm -hmm. it is illegal to transport. So you have to have permits to transport anything, um, whether it be native or non-native, and the same with collection. And those permits come from uh, State Department Fish and Wildlife. Uh, we don't have a site for reporting. Um, it's not like iBird. You can, you can actually go on iNaturalist and you can report sightings there but it's not monitored by anybody locally. Yeah, if, if for some reason, uh, I always love playing, identify the egg mass and amphibians. So if you ever find something and you don't know what it is and you wanna know what it is, feel free uh, to shoot me an email with a photo in it and I will attempt to identify it for you. <laughs> Another question we have is if we have any plans for stream or terrestrial breeding webinars. We do not. Stream team does not because we don't have um, we don't have a lot of those species here in Thurston County, and primarily they're in higher elevations. And I don't believe Fish and Wildlife has anything planned at this time. Um, it's a possibility that if if we have interest and Lamise, if there's um, somebody, if you're able, or if you have somebody else that's able to, I'm more than willing to to actually host those kind of talks. Yeah, I totally do it. I like talking about frogs and salamanders, so <laughs> I'd be happy to do it. Okay. Uh, How about that last question about um, the rough skin nude having a balancer organ that looks like feelers? Do other amphibian larvae have them too? Yeah, so long-toed salamanders, we often see the balancers on them. Uh, and we see them on Northwesterns too. They're pretty obvious on long toads as well when they kind of first pop out, so. Yeah, and that's sometimes how I'm able to identify if it's a long-toed salamander um, egg because um, it's really difficult to see that, that double membrane. Mm -hmm. And, and they're, they're the very first ones that start ovidepositing. So, when the eggs start developing, you can usually see the gills and the, um, the balancers on those. So that's another way that I've done for, to help me identify those egg um, packets because they're very small. Sometimes there's one egg, sometimes yeah. <laughs> five or seven eggs and they, they look like, they often will look like um, tree frog packets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, anything else that we, um, site for reporting, uh, somebody requested that we type, that we put that in live and that would be iNaturalist, but it does, iNaturalist I think is, 
is sponsored by UW, um, but there's nobody locally that actually is tracking it. And there's not a tracking, there isn't a local tracking of amphibians at Department of Fish and Wildlife. They do have a website, or not a website, but they do have a database where they, where they store egg mass surveys that we actually submit to them. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure what's happening with that now that you no longer have a data person. Yeah, um, we do still have the Washington Herp Atlas, um, which is a really good resource too. If anybody, you know, if you want to learn about uh, amphibians and reptiles that are in the Pacific Northwest, it's got a lot of good pictures and like how to identify them and stuff like that. Um, and we've generally tried to use that to keep up with people submitting locations and stuff to us, but our website has been overhauled. So it's a little more difficult to get all of this in. Is there any more questions? Thanks, Lamise. It's been great having you again. So yeah, happy to do it. Yeah, look forward to being able to go out in the field with all of you guys at some point. Mm -hmm. All right, that's it. Cool. And do watch our uh, stream team website, streamteam.info. Um, under the citizen science folder, we'll be posting this talk and I'll also post the egg mass little booklet that I've made up. Oh, looks like we got one more question. Oh, just a thank you. <laughs> Great. Thanks. Thanks everybody for coming. <laughs>